Joining us now is uh, Dr. Eugenie Scott, uh, Director of National Center for Science Education of USA, not from Romania. <laughs> um, she uh, agreed to, take, uh, to, to an interview with us, and uh, we thank her very much for this. You're welcome. And we, well, as a starter, can you present yourself and tell us what you generally do? And uh, Sure. The National Center for Science Education is a, an American uh, not-for-profit organization. And since the um, early 1980s, uh, the organization has been concerned about efforts to get creationism taught in the American public school science classes. And the national office was opened in the late 80s with uh, me as the executive director. And we have been, since that time, working with teachers and school boards and parents and state legislators, other interested parties who want to keep good science in and keep non-science views out of the public school science classroom. I see. Um, well, currently you are very well known as a, as a strong supporter of uh, science education and especially evolution. Uh, when did you uh, realize that there is a need for people to take a stand against anti-evolution and anti-science propaganda? Well, pretty much in the late 1970s and early 80s, there was a push on by creationists to try to get legislation in the um, states that would require that if you taught evolution, you had to teach something called creation science. Mm -hmm about which I spoke in the talk today, briefly anyway. And of course, this would be just dreadful education. And so scientists and teachers banded together to try to keep these laws uh, from being passed. And it was a real education for scientists who don't usually think politically. Um, one thing I like to remind people is that if it was about the science, I wouldn't have a job, and mm -hmm. that's okay, but it isn't. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, if it's about the science, we win, yes, <laughs> just of hands down. Yeah. But it isn't. It's really politics, mm -hmm. and um, the American education system is very decentralized, so we have local elected school boards making these decisions. Because they're elected, that means politics is involved. And so what scientists found back in the early 80s is that they had to persuade these school boards to not pass this legislation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough just to walk in and say, this is what good science is, this is what we should yes. be doing. Yes. So it's been a real education, but I've been interested since the early 1980s, about the time when the National Center for Science Education got started as well. Is the National uh, Center for, for Science Education a, a government-funded institution? Or <laughs> no, I'll ask. <laughs> no, afraid not. Um, we, uh, we exist solely as a result of donations from our members and some private foundation grants. It's not that there's any rule that says we can't apply for um, uh, money from the government. It's just that we'd have to apply from federal agencies like the National Science Foundation that funds uh, public um, uh, that, that funds science research or education science education research. And frankly, uh, because we deal with uh, a controversial issue and because there are a lot of legislators out there who would think that we are anti-religious, and we're not anti-religious, we're, we're just anti-bad science education, it would just complicate matters. So we, we just don't even try. Mm -hmm. uh, does that uh, impact in any way your, your, um, your activity? Your, does it limit in any way you, what you can actually achieve? It doesn't limit what we can achieve because, um, well, yes, uh, clearly for any uh, uh, nonprofit organization, you are limited by your budget. Uh, basically, what we do is, is we provide information to people, and so we need to hire human beings to transmit that information. So of most of my uh, budget goes to pay salaries for smart people to do the work. Um, it, we certainly don't spend it on facilities if you ever saw our office, that'd be clear. Um, but um, I lost track of what <laughs> the original question was. I was thinking about my poor facilities. But <laughs> yes, I was asking if, if 
the fact that you don't get... Oh, am I limited as yes, far as... Yes. The, no, other than just not being able to hire enough people to get enough work done. There are restrictions on nonprofit organizations in the United States as to um, what you can do and still retain your nonprofit status. Mm -hmm. By nonprofit status, that means that the income we take in, uh, we don't have to pay tax on it. Uh, but uh, in order for that privileged status, uh, we cannot engage in any kind of electoral politics. So we cannot support or oppose candidates. We can, um, we can lobby in the sense of we can inform our members and inform members of the general public about a uh, piece of legislation that's, that's come up. Mm -hmm. There are limitations of that nature, that there's only so much of our uh, time or budget that we can spend on those kinds of activities and still remain a nonprofit. But most of what we do is, um, as one of, uh, as we often like to refer to, we hand out the fire extinguishers. <laughs> it's, it's the, P there, there are 50 states and about 15,000 school districts. It's a big country. Mm -hmm. No way can one little organization, underfunded as we've, uh, as we've agreed, uh, in California can be in all these places. So the service that we provide is to help people in the local community to um, understand what they need to do in order to get a good outcome on whatever situation they're dealing with. How to write a letter to the editor of a newspaper, how to make a, an effective presentation to the mm -hmm. school board. What's the information you need to know about science, about evolution, about uh, whatever creationist position is out there? What about religion? What about the law? Mm -hmm. So we're a repository of a lot of information and experience in how to handle these kinds of situations. And that's the fire extinguisher we give them to put out the brush fire. Yes. Um, you talked about uh, political influences. Um, how would you see uh, your activity changing in the light of a possible future creationist president? Hmm. Well, the good news for me is that the federal government has very little to do with uh, the curriculum in education. Um, we have a very decentralized education system and curricular decisions, exactly what is taught in the classroom, is made at the local level. Mm -hmm. Now, the difficulty with having a president who, shall we say, is not enlightened scientifically, we've had them before, <laughs> uh, is that it sets a tone that it tends to trickle down and can be very inspirational with the grassroots where we work. Mm -hmm. But the uh, federal policy really doesn't influence very much what's actually taught in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Now, this may be changing slightly. Um, the United States has never had uh, national, well, it's never had a national curriculum, mm -hmm. and it never will. Um, but there's a difference between the curriculum, which is sort of what is actually followed in the classroom, and the standards, which is a more higher level description of the general categories yeah. and concepts. Uh, we've never had a national standards set for science either. But that may be changing, because currently there's an, uh, a movement going um, to try to come up with national science standards which then, if adopted by the states, would be then used by the local school districts to develop the actual curriculum that's used in the classroom. It's always a multi-tiered kind of process. Mm -hmm. But if we can get national science standards to be adopted across the states, that would do a great deal to break up the very patchwork kind of education problem that we have in this state. And, and that would actually reduce the amount of work you actually have to put in to, to stop the... the Ideally, yeah. ideally, yeah, because the national standards, because they are being written by uh, professional scientists and uh, professional educators who really are solid people, I know these folks, they will include evolution, they will include global warming, they will include these controversial issues. Now, having it in the actual standards, even if it gets translated to the curricula that teachers use, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be taught once the classroom door is shut. Yes. So there still is going to be a lot of grassroots education necessary to try to 
help the teachers know that they're going to be supported if they teach evolution, mm -hmm. um, and that um, the administrators will back them up if a parent complains or something oh, okay. like that. So the potential to actually teach good science increases very much. I, yes, I think so. If yeah. we get good, solid national standards, it's going to be better. Okay. But unfortunately, it won't solve the whole problem. I see. Uh, can you tell us, uh, let's say, three reasons why creationism is not science? Mm. Well, um, for one thing, it abandons a very important principle of science which is that we restrict ourselves to the explanation of nature using natural causes. It brings in supernatural causes, which are untestable. Mm -hmm. If you can't test an explanation, you, can't be, uh, you cannot claim that you are doing science. It also begins with a conclusion and um, uh, looks for confirming information for that conclusion. Uh, rather than being open to uh, um, confirming and disconfirming information. In fact, perhaps the worst thing that uh, they do in this line is that they ignore the information that disproves their, their, their uh, hypothesis, their, their claim. And the third example, since you've asked me for three, <laughs> is that they are unwilling to change their explanations with new data. Yeah. Uh, they basically take the uh, special creation position as presented in uh, a, a literal interpretation of the Bible. And um, this is how it was. And they are never willing to change uh, that position. Yeah. This, of course, varies quite a bit. I mean, that, that is only one position within Christianity, and there are many positions within Christianity that are perfectly compatible with evolution. And those people are very helpful to us when we have a problem at the local school board. Yes. For instance, Kenan Miller, as far as I know, uh -huh. has been really instrumental in the uh, Kitz Miller versus uh, Dover trial. Can you uh, tell us why was that trial that important in the U.S.? We knew that there were a number of school districts and a number of states that had at the ready legislation or regulations that if the Dover policy were declared to be constitutional, those bills were going to be filed, those school districts were going to pass those policies, and the idiom in English is Katie bar the door. It's, <laughs> it would be just a flood mm -hmm. of, these, um, of these policies. And that would have very adversely affected the teaching of science in the United States. Because any of these, you know, intelligent design or traditional young earth creationism, any of these um, uh, kinds of, of non-science ideas plopped down into, this, into the curriculum really misleads kids about what science is and uh, how science goes about coming to its conclusions. And even more so than um, just uh, uh, misleading students about the value of evolution to science, it's really distorting their understanding of science itself. And that's, that's something to fight against. Yes. It actually affects all science, it doesn't uh -huh. affect only evolution. Precisely. Uh, yeah, let, let's switch to what I sometimes call as, uh, call as International creation, Creationism Incorporated. <laughs> uh, in